Welcome to our continuing series of virtual voices, which is in, uh, in relationship to the sustainable development goals that have been developed by the United Nations. Uh, today, our speaker is Stephanie Katzman, who is Executive Vice President of the Katzman Produce. Our moderator is Susie Halleck, who is our UN representative at, uh, at the United Nations and is also the regional director of United States and Middle East. Our introduction is going to be by Dr. Mark Robson, who is the Rutgers University Board of Governors Distinguished Professor in Environment and biological sciences. So over to you, Mark. So we now have the scarecrow in the picture, right? Very good. <laughs> so thank you, dear colleagues, for the chance to introduce this important topic. I'm excited to hear our speakers' insights and experiences. Dr. Durbach asked me to spend just a few minutes on the importance of nutritious food and the problems of world food shortages, which is an important component to the presentation we're about to hear. And you have to go back to early times, if you look in the Western civilization to Hippocrates, who made the statement, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. I think no more do we see, any, anywhere else do we see the importance of nutritious food than when we start to look at the quote from our famous early physician Hippocrates, because it not only serves the generation today, but future generations. And future generations are a remarkable concern for us. You know, about the time that I appeared on the globe in the 1950s, the population of the world was quite modest. But as you know, going forward by 2050, there will be almost 10 billion inhabitants on Earth. So not only the importance of nutritious food, but adequate food supply. If we look at the regions in the world right now where we continue to see increases in uh, people who have inadequate nutrition, we see that it concentrates in the global south but especially on the African continent, realizing as well that this is where the largest growth in population is gonna take place. Certainly there are more people in India, there are more people in China, but the fastest growing population are countries in Africa. I was struck by that myself back in May of 2019 when we could still travel, when I started a project in Niger, only to realize that the mean age of a citizen in Niger is 15. So Dr. Durbach said, well, how do we get people to eat nutritiously? And I said, you know, that's a very difficult question, Professor. How do we do that? Well, we give them lots of guides, assuming for a moment they have adequate food. Um, and we've had many, many attempts at making it user-friendly. The most recent one, of course, is Choose My Plate in the United States. For years, we had the food pyramid and people thought that was too hard to follow. So here's the current thinking. And then they translate it for us with how many servings of each kind of food you should have. Um, but you have to take that and translate it into the population. So here's a project we had in rural Thailand where my students and I are taking basic measurements. What's the height and weight of these beautiful little children in these rural communities? Because we have to remember that one in four children around the globe, especially in developing countries, are stunted. That means that they don't have adequate food. They don't have the right nutrients in the food that they have. So one in four uh, children are small for their size, they are small for their age, and they don't have the resources to grow normally and healthy. Now, the other problem we have, and this is a campaign from Thailand as well, in a rural health clinic, are those people who have excess calories. Folks who are now 39% uh, of people in many countries, in the United States, 52% of Americans are overweight, 39% are obese. In Thailand, it's 11% are obese. This was unheard of a few years ago. So countries are having these campaigns to help people have nutritious food, not just adequate calories, but nutritious calories. Uh, the food hotspots as a result of the COVID pandemic have manifested themselves primarily in Africa, a little bit in uh, Central Asia, and as well as parts of South America but this is a critical and ever-growing burden. 
as we look at news reports from news feeds from Reuters and BBC and other places, we see things like UN warned of impending famine, millions for starvation, or an article that was fairly recent at the beginning of the year in the Washington Post. The coronavirus intensifies a hunger crisis. Uh, and 2021, the year we're in now, is going to be worse. How do we see it translate? We translate things like prices for staples. Think about it. 50% of the world's almost 9 billion people get part or all of their calories from rice. 50%. And look at the price of rice. This is Thai rice, but you can overlay this with Philippine rice or Vietnamese rice or rice from India. The model's the same. As we went into the end of 2020, rice prices went up dramatically. And these are the people that need to rely on this. So as we get ready to hear our exciting speaker and listen to the insights that Stephanie provides us, keep in mind this part. Keep in mind that there are already 17 million people, 17 million children under the age of five in 55 countries. And that was in 2019 that were acutely malnourished. And going forward, as we look at 2020, we saw that this went even higher. And as we start to look at this, we realize that in addition to the pandemic, we have political instability, changes in climate, and then natural events like locusts and changes in the economy that really, really put the world's food at risk. So we need to have nutritious food. We need to have adequate food. We're aware of the consequences when this doesn't occur. And I'm very excited to hear our speaker's insights. Thank you very much for letting me introduce this exciting topic. Thank you very much, Mark, for a very important and relevant introduction. And now over to you, Susie. Thank you so much, Dr. Durback and Dr. Mark Robson for the insightful presentation on the food insecurity issue. This is an area of focus of one of four UN Sustainable Development Goals we're discussing through this interactive session. One is achieving food security and improved nutrition by wasting less food and donating what we don't use, promoting good health and well being, providing inclusive education and lifelong learning opportunities for all, and lastly, strengthening global partnerships, especially between the public and private sector, to achieve all of these goals. During my incredible years working with the World Information Transfer, I attended numerous UN sessions where we talked about the power of public and private sector partnerships to accomplish sustainable development goals and solutions like the ones I just mentioned. It's so critical that private organizations invest in these efforts to help drive change in the global community. And I'm excited to invite Stephanie Katzen here today to talk about the great ways she's contributing to help resolve these important issues. It starts locally and then it expands globally through information transferring the way we're doing here today. Stephanie is the executive vice president and fourth generation in her family of a 100 year old business, S. Katzman Produce. And she's committed to combating food insecurity, supporting educational opportunities for the youth, and making sure that children have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. She does this by working with top food banks throughout the city and with schools and nonprofit youth organizations such as Dream, who recently honored her as a woman leader in business for her extensive work with the school and its programs. I really look up to female leaders like Stephanie who take action on such important issues. And I think this session will be great for us to all learn about how private companies can pu public, uh, partner with public sector to achieve sustainable development goals. So Stephanie, so happy to have you. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, we have some great topics ahead of us to talk about. So I'm really excited. Thank you. Um, so. To kick off, can you tell us a bit about Katzman's role in the supply chain? How do you work with suppliers and customers? And how does that translate to increased and broader access to healthy and affordable produce? Absolutely. So as a wholesaler distributor in the produce industry, we're really that middleman in the supply chain. So we help move produce from the farm to the retailers so that you can all go shopping and bring it home to your houses. Um, and it's not just moving the produce along, it's really moving that information piece along too. So we're that logistical agent, um, really kind of hit it, hitting all that those aspects. 
Um, we deal with a wide range of customers. So we handle those big supermarkets uh, such as Whole Foods, ShopRite, Stop and Shop that have hundreds of stores all around the country and some are international around the world as well um, to those mid-size supermarkets. So you might have somebody who owns four or five in a small chain, some of those banner stores, and then some of your small mom and pop shops, especially here in the New York City area. We have a lot of one-off stores um, with the mass amount of population we have specifically in New York City alone. There's lots of little stores um, on every corner uh, that people shop in. So we hit a wide range. It kind of gives us that ability to reach all of the end consumers too, because you have so many people out there who shop in so many different ways. Uh, especially over this last year, we've had a lot of online shopping that has happened too. So all of those new things that pop up uh, just give us one more one more place to go with all these fresh fruits and vegetables. That's awesome. So as you continue to grow as a major player in the supply chain and your company expands, hitting all of these different players, um, what are the core values that drive Katzman's culture and your role and contributions to provide healthy produce in the local community? Absolutely. So uh, our two main driving forces, I would say, would be combating food insecurities, uh, especially in our area, and then uh, helping children. You know, it's, it's, and it's a two, two part really there. It's helping teach them about the importance of eating right and eating healthy, and then also giving them access to that fresh fruit um, and fruit, fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables that they might not have access to um, otherwise. You know, where we're located specifically, and I know there's many aspects of this all over the world, we're in a, a food desert. So we have a, you know, low income community. We don't have a lot of stores around in the area too. So they don't have a lot of access to these fresh fruits and vegetables. So being able to get out there and help the families in our community and being able to get out there and help children while they're young and really instill these values in them um, is, re is really what kind of drives us. That's amazing. And um, do you want to tell a bit about the heart values that that drive as well? Absolutely. So um, internally here, um, we have our, our heart culture and everything that, you know, we hold true here, you know, adapting to all the changing needs around us, uh, being respectful of our team, you know, working hard as a team to make sure we can reach out there to the community and um, internally here as well. I mean, one of the neat things about uh, our business is we have so many people from our community that also work here. Um, so when we're reaching out there to our community, we're kind of taking our, our team here too and being able to get out there and help their families and make them a part of it. And you know, we, we bring those same values back internally as well. That's amazing. And having the heart values, how that drives internally and translates to external contributions to the community is incredible and would be cool to see how your actions can inspire others to do the same. So collectively we'll achieve a global impact. Um, so going into the, the food insecurity issue that Dr. Mark Rob Robson uh, went over in his presentation, um, could you tell us a bit about your efforts at Catspin and helping resolve this very real and widespread problem? Absolutely. So we, you know, we move product all around and it really, I think, help combat, combat, um, helps combat this from the beginning. You know, being able to be that last mile delivery to all the stores, uh, being able to get out there and get the produce out there to all different, um, all different areas in the community is great. But then what, what can you really do after that? So it's how do we get the produce besides just the stuff we're selling? So we, we partner up with um, food banks all around uh, the city and actually further out than New York as well. We work with um, the City Harvest. We work with the Food Bank of New York. We work with Feeding Westchester. And being able to work with those, you know, public uh, entities that have the government support, they, they do a really great job in, in distributing produce. But you know, even they don't have the ability to get out there and do enough. So we work with some smaller private organizations as well. Um, we work with organizations like you mentioned, Dream, who does a fabulous job, not just getting produce out there to their family and to their community, and they help us with the distribution in their area. Um, they also work with the those uh, students. You know, they form charter schools. They've incorporated 
um, teaching them about fruits and vegetables and some of the in some of their learnings. They've made it part of their after school programs. They've tied it in with some of their sports programs. So being able to work with organizations like that just gives us one more way to get back out there to the community. Um, you know, I think over the over the past year, between all these uh, organizations, we, we donate about a million pounds worth of produce. And just being able to get it out there and make it available for people who otherwise wouldn't have it available um, is one thing because it's it's helping with food waste, but really it's getting them the nutritional value they need. Fruits and vegetables, I mean, we actually saw it on there, the Choose Your Plate um, program has come a long way over the years. Um, some of you might not know the the portion of our circle on that plate used to be very small and it's now become one of the main center plates on a lot of these uh, food meal plans. So that, that's been really great to see as well. Thank you. Um, and that ties back as we were talking about earlier, the UN sustainable development goal to waste less food, donate what we don't use. Um, could you give some more examples of how you achieve this goal, um, not only through your work with Katzman and the um, partnership with Dream, but um, I know you founded a company called Bad Apple as well. Um, you may have touched on some of these examples in your previous response, but anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the neat things about our business, I think, is we, we, we deal with food insecurity and we deal with food waste, not just through these kind of extra things that we can do, but our regular business too. So the way our business model works is we, we sell what needs to be sold. And that's the way we work with our farmers. So we partner with our farmers and they might have perfect produce that gets produced. And that's usually what you see on your retail shelves. But I mean, mother nature does have final say here. So you'll have product that might be misshapen. You might have some product that tastes perfectly fine, but has some bruising damage. Uh, maybe something uh, was off size or off um, specs for some of these retail stores. And it's our job to find outlets for that product as well. So we have a wide range of customers. Like I mentioned, some of those customers might work in processing uh, places. They might work in juiceries. They might work in a kitchen where they can use maybe a slightly bruised peach because they're going to cut it up afterwards. Or they don't mind if you know their strawberries are a little bit dull on the outside because they're going to use them in a baked good. So something like that that gives them you know that that gives us that ability to go other places before. We get to the point where we'd have to donate the produce is like one of one of the first key parts of our business. Um, of course, all the organizations I spoke about just before that we're able to work with to just get that produce out there. Um, and then really, I guess the, the last piece, um, even before uh, we'd have to go to the dumpster with something, if it makes it to that point is sometimes we'll send stuff right back to our farmers um, if it's not good enough to sell and they'll actually use it in the soil. So they'll give back, there's plenty of nutrients in, in the produce and they'll turn it right back into their soil, um, giving nutrients back into the ground and helping the environment. It's amazing. Um, and through your partnerships have have you been able to help in terms of making produce more affordable as well, do you find in your business or um, is it more so through the donation piece that you feel like you're contributing? So, so I'd say it's, it's a two-parter with our business because we have, um, you know, it's, it's our job to make sure that we get all of the produce sold that's produced. So that might be something um, as simple as finding um a retailer who's willing to sell a little bit extra and put it out on sale. You know, some of these smaller retailers that we work with, maybe not the bigger chains, but some of these smaller guys, we can pick up the phone and give them a call and have them change their retail pricing. So maybe they had, you know, their retail set at $3.99 and they were selling strawberries and we had beautiful weather a couple days in a row and crops produce amazing amounts. And we brought all of this product in and now I have five times as much to sell as I thought I was going to. I get on the phone, tell them to drop their retail down to $1.99 or maybe even 99 cents, and they'll get the produce out there. And, and that's really a, a key factor in, in moving in the supply chain is knowing like what buttons to push. So it's either going to be an increase or a decrease in supply, and you're going to get your increase or decrease in price. I always say our, our business is page one of your economics textbook. You know, Once, once you learn the, the ins and outs of it, you can figure out how to kind of play it. And being able to make those maneuvers and really figure out where to go with stuff allows us to sell extra when we need to, which cuts down on waste, which makes it more affordable when there's extra product to go around. And 
you know, as, as a wholesaler, we sell every fruit and vegetable you can think of. Um, and we, we bring um, product in from all over the world. So every international product you can think of too, we probably sell or do business with someone who has so we can source it. But being able to kind of expand people's palates and be able to give them all of that kind of product um, and even giving them access to stuff they might not have. So not even just affordable, but stuff they might not have even heard of before or seen before. Um, kind of ex expanding their palates, but also, you know, expanding their knowledge on product. There's lots of products out there that um, have nutri nutrients in it that add to a healthy lifestyle that we might not have access to because they don't grow here. You know, we don't, we don't have all those perfect growing conditions that they have all over the world year round. So um, that's definitely a, a big part of it too. And then that educational piece, um, I, I really think kind of backs up all the produce because you can give it out, you can donate it and people are gonna eat it. But I think instilling these healthy habits in children when they're young, very important and making sure that they understand that, yes, this is good and it tastes good, but it's also good for you and important that you eat it. You know, there's lots of vitamin C, lots of vitamin D. There's tons, all different kinds of vitamins, obviously, but there's some major ones that, you know, we take for granted or that everyone takes vitamins for in the morning, that if we just work a few fruits and vegetables into our diets, we'll be able to take it naturally. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, goes into the education topic we wanted to go into next, which, um, as we're, we're focusing on the youth and children in schools, um, it all ties back to um, establishing these habits early on. Um, why do you think that's so important and how it all ties together in shaping, in shaping our community? Absolutely. So I think one of the most important things that we can do is um, instill these healthy habits in children when they're young. Um, if they learn to do it now, it becomes a habit for them. It becomes just part of their normal diets. It won't even something you have to, you know, teach them or try and get them to eat their broccoli when they're older or anything like that, because they've grown up eating it. So they've grown up liking it. They've developed the palate for it and they've grown up feeling good. You know, most people say, oh yeah, sure. No problem. Fruits and vegetables. I know they're good for you, but until you've experienced it and actually felt better, you know, it really might not sink in. So I think ed the education piece is important partnering with giving them the access to it. And then you want to make it fun for them too. So, I mean, we, we work with a couple of schools in the area um, where we do food donations to some for take home and then some for them to eat in the school, like during their lunch period or their snack period. And, you know, one of the things I do with it is I try and come up with a different fruit to have them try each week. So, you know, what one time we sent a, a lychee nut to them and it's this exotic fruit and it comes looking kind of weird and it's got this neat shell on the outside and there's a unique way to eat it. And kind of, I had to send a video along with them to teach them about it. But, you know, the, the comments I got back or the cards I get from them during the holidays or stuff like that just kind of exemplifies how important it was. You know, oh, I've never tasted it before. Oh, this is wonderful. I brought one piece home to my parents and they wanted it. I told them I wanted them to find it out in the store. So when you get that kind of response and you see it working and you, you know you're making a difference and you know, we really have the responsibility to, to kind of have that impact based on the industry that we're in and our ability to do so. And the fact that there's so many people out there that don't have that access and don't have that ability you know, we have to help the people who really can't help themselves because we can do it. Agreed. Um, so could you tell us a bit about uh, the professional and education opportunities that you're contributing to either through internship, scholarship programs, especially for the marginalized and disadvantaged groups in the community? Absolutely. So we have several programs that we run here. You know, we're big on health and nutrition dealing in our industry, and then we're also big on education. So we've uh, rolled out an internship program here um, in, in our business. We've rolled out a scholarship program that we offer out to all of our employees' um, children. So anybody who works here, and we've um, worked with different um, schools um, such as Dreams, such as Easter Seals, 
um, such as a few um, charter schools in our area, um, both sending you know fruit out to them and educational tools out to them, but also bringing them in here. And we've done tours around our market, teaching them about the supply chain, teaching them about sustainability, teaching them about the different impacts on everything. You know, we bring produce in from all over the world, so that means that we're getting it by boat. Uh, we're bringing stuff in by plane, you know, all domestically. We're bringing stuff all over uh, by train and by tractor trailer and trucks. So we have all these different methods of bringing produce from around the world to where we are um, and all the different impacts it has on the environment that it has on the labor force, that technology, the impact that that's had in the business. So I think all of these different pieces has it you know, is so much information that not only can they use in business, they can really use in life. A lot of the stuff in our business is, is very common sense oriented. So I think that that education, it just puts us in a, in a great spot to be that educational tool for them. It's incredible. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, it kind of shapes all together. Um, and so I wanted to kind of take a step to reflect on this past year that um, Dr. Mark Robson talked about the COVID-19 pandemic um, was very difficult for and puts a strain on the produce industry and, and the whole food insecurity issue. Um, so what are some of the learnings that you've drawn being in this business that would help inspire others to be prepared for in future disruptions in the supply chain um, knowing that such disruptions always have a stronger impact on the most vulner vulnerable and disadvantaged groups. Yeah. So our experience um, over this past year has really taught us how important it is to have a solid supply chain in place. So, you know, we, of course, had to deal with many challenges that came along um, throughout everything. But one of the things we found out is we were very prepared for everything that came our way. You know, our job as a wholesaler in the supply chain is really to be that middleman who can handle all those curveballs, who can figure out how to be that last mile delivery. So throughout um, this past year, we've run into the challenges and we've seen the challenges at the farming level and at our retailer level too, whether it be shortages of labor, whether it be, you know, just people's emotions, whether it be just the environment you're in, all, all being, you know, a challenge out there and having to make adjustments and having to power through it is kind of, you know, what we do on a regular basis. So we found out that we're set up for success for the out of the ordinary type of scenario. So we've had, you know, you, you I'm sure you've all experienced, especially in the beginning that we saw lots of um, empty shelves in the supermarkets, you know, especially those first three weeks, really, you know, about a year ago now, where you go to the supermarket and you just, there's picture after picture of empty shelves, uh, produce and everything like that. And although there, there was plenty of produce being grown, you know, there was hiccups in the supply chain because you'd have customer demand shifts. So as you, you know, people were interested in cleaning supplies, toilet paper, you know, masks, they were, these were all taking up space on trucks, um, whether they are space in the warehouse or allocation of labor. So you'd see some shortages at the end, maybe, um, produce on the shelves, but the supply chain had to keep moving. So, you know, we had to work around a couple of things where instead of going to some distribution centers from some of our major stores, we'd make direct store deliveries. We'd make um, adjustments throughout the time of day. There are some stores who, you know, we used to deliver to in the morning that we just have to adjust and we'd have to do two deliveries or every other day. So one of the things we learned from the experience was the solid supply chain you have in, we have in place is very, very important in any business. And it, it sounds simple, obviously, you need the logistical piece to work, but I think the logistical piece is the most important where some people kind of look at it as the fill-in between operations. If the logistical piece falls down, the chain kind of breaks and you can't really go on to that next step. So step one and step two are very important, but the in-between getting from step to one to step two, I think is the most important part. And then I think the other main takeaway we had from it was um, having a variety, a diverse customer base. So there were businesses out there, you know, restaurants that completely went out of business. They, you know, they lost their entire clientele because they closed down restaurants. You know, here in New York, they're just starting to open them back up again. And there's plenty of companies that weren't able to open back up. 
And then there's other distribution companies similar to ours, but um, maybe without a diverse customer base. You know, there's one in our area who was 90 to 95% food service and restaurant uh, hospitality. So, you know, in a blink of an eye, he lost 95% of his business. You can't really recover immediately from something like that. And it's going to have a long lasting effect, especially when those companies don't come back up. So we have a nice even mix between retail, food service, restaurants, big accounts, small accounts, you know, no one type, no one customer makes up more than I think two to 3% of our business. And most of them are less than 1%. So being able to make adjustments um, that we can't control, you know, we, we lost about 30% of our business when all the restaurants closed, we saw a little bit of a spike in retail and we had the rest of our business kind of fall back on. So th those would be my two, two takeaways and my two words of wisdom is make sure you have a very strong supply chain in place. Logistics is everything and make sure that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, make sure that you have a diverse customer base uh, so that no one impact can really hurt you because um, you never know what can happen when there's things out there you can't really control. Yeah, that's really insightful. And um, you have like an obligation to the community as well. So keeping those things in mind and, and it benefits everyone. Um, Absolutely. You know, you. We, 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 supply, we supply them regularly. They, they were counting on us. We, we got countless phone calls from people. Are you still open? Can you still deliver? You know, we, we'd have customers calling us up saying, you know, half, half of our store, you know, I, all of my employees called out, can you make an extra delivery customers are normally picked up. Uh, so being, being able to be there for them, like you said, being that partner. And really, that's the way we are with our retailers on a regular basis. You know, we are that extension of their warehouse, you know, specifically in our area, um, real estate is very expensive. So they use their floor plan of their stores to really sell everything they can. So we're their added warehouse, where they're fresh refills on a daily basis from product that they've brought in from all over the world and they can't store. So it's, it's, a, it's a great partnership we have with them. It's amazing. So I have one final question and then okay. we could open up to some of the questions from the audience. Um, we talked a lot about the issues that you're passionate about, Stephanie, and contributing to, and then reflected on the past year uh, with COVID. Now, could you give some um, predictions on where you think the produce industry is going from here, how there's innovation um, that's, that's happening from an environmental perspective? And do you have any predictions for what we'll see in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. And if you asked me about a year ago, I might even have a different answer. Um, so I, is, this will be a cool one. So I think we're going to see kind of a, a battle going on between trendy new ideas, new packaging, maybe um, new things that people want and are looking for. And then that social accountability piece, making sure that we're not just adding packaging without taking into account the effect it's going to have on the environment. You know, up until about a year ago now, the big trend in our industry was getting away from packaging. So we used to have lots of plastic and things like that. We've gone over to more biodegradable types of packaging or less packaging altogether. Um, you've seen some trends that were coming up where certain items they were adding package to, whether it be a value added um, grab and go pack. So something that you could just easily go in um, to the store, grab it off the shelf, take it with you because we're always on the run here. So kind of that, that mix back and forth. And then with COVID's impact and people going now caring more about packaging all of their product and wanting more, you know, things packed up in plastic bags that they could just grab either quickly off the shelf or that they felt was more protected. So we, we were kind of going in one direction and then we kind of shifted back. So I think it's going to be a little bit interesting to see where it lands. And I think that's really going to depend upon what the customer's demands are. Um, and that's a lot of what drives our industry. You know, we, we, we can come up with this great new package, but if the customer doesn't like it or this great new fruit, but if it doesn't eat good and the customer doesn't like it, we really don't have anywhere to go with it. Um, and new fruits is, and flavor is, re is really the other thing that I'm really excited about for, for our industry. You know, there's so many neat items out there that they've developed over the years between, you know, crossbreeding, cross-pollination, grafting plants together, there's so many different varieties of apples. Um, we have new products all together. I mean, there, there's a product out there called a pluot, which is a cross between a plum and an apricot when they graft the trees together. There's so many neat things that they're doing 
to just bring new and exciting fruits and vegetables to the consumer is just amazing. And then, and then the, the R&D, the research and development that's really been spent by so many companies on flavor um, and that consumer experience has been one of the biggest shifts. I mean, obviously all farmers want to grow a product that tastes good, but really focusing on figuring out what's going to get that extra flavor in there, what's going to get that extra sugar, and really spending a lot of time and money developing these new varieties of plants that are just so exciting to eat. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that adds to that education piece too, because if you're teaching somebody that this is good for you and then they eat it and they have that great experience, they're going to be more likely to continue on with that habit. They're going to go back looking for that product again. They're going to go back looking for similar products that, you know, they enjoyed this one. Maybe they're going to enjoy something else. So I think making sure that, you know, we're just keeping our eyes open to see what else is out there. Um, it's going to be really exciting in the coming years. It's amazing. Thank you. Um, and so we just had such a great presentations from Dr. Mark Robson and Stephanie. Um, and now we have some questions here from the audience that we'll go into. The first question for Stephanie is, um, well, uh, Nastia Kozlava, thanks you for having the great opportunity to be here and for the great presentation. Um, and she's wondering how, um, how you think we can better encourage children to choose fruits and vegetables instead of typical junk food. Um, is, and I know that's something that you were talking about earlier, your passion for educating the youth. Um, do you have any ideas there? Well, absolutely. So I'm a big fan of making a game out of it for them. You know, we're doing everything we can. The farmers are doing everything they can to grow delicious fruit. Um, you know, we're doing everything we can in the supply chain to get that delicious fruit to you. So if you're looking for ways to encourage children to eat, um, I'm a big fan of making a game out of it. So whether it's, you know, putting one, one really good tasting uh, fruit on their plate each time and having that be what they eat. Um, there's great products out there too. So we're, we're we just started selling a new item called Sticky Lickets. It's actually a plant-based sticker. It's 100% natural. So it, we can sell it because it's produce also, um, but it's a sticker that goes on produce for kids and it entices them to eat it more because it makes a game out of it. So it's cartoon characters and they lick the sticker and they put it right on an apple, strawberry, pear, you name it, and they can eat it. Works on broccoli, vegetables too. So, so you're good there. Um, the other piece I think is don't, don't give them something that they don't like. There's so many fruits and vegetables out there. There's so many flavors. If they don't like one, try a different one, you know, don't force it on them because then they'll group it all together. Um, and then get, get at them when you're young. I know, I know I said it a million times, but I think it's so important. If you think about all the junk food that kids eat now, it's because that's might've been what they had access to when they were little. So they learn to like it. You can learn to like fruit as well. Thank you. Um, there's a question here for Dr. Robson. Um, so uh, Vadim was wondering, um, he, he read an article about artificial meat and it said that artificial meat could, should stay in developed countries and meat of animal origin is less in less developed countries. Do you agree with this statement? Um, and he's interested in, in your opinion and maybe um, artificial meat decide the problem with food. So, so that's a very interesting question. And no, I don't agree with that opinion at all. <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, there's three, three parts to it. The first part is that new technology should be made available to everybody. And whether you're in the most developed country like South Korea or, or Japan or the US, or you're in a country that's, you know, very much in the beginning stages of starting to uh, increase its economic uh, output and, and you're, you know, at the other end of among the you know, really struggling, sometimes developing countries, everyone should have the option. Now it has to be right sized. It has to make its way into the marketplace. I mean, you know, Stephanie will tell you that when pe people come to her with a good idea, she'll look at the good idea, but then she'll see if it's actually going to be marketable and if it's actually going to be profitable. Because if it's not profitable, Stephanie's not going to stay there too long. But when we look at something like uh, you know plant based protein products, or as some people say, artificial meat. Uh, they are, we'd like to say more like animal protein supplements. We know that it's highly beneficial to the uh, stopping climate change. We know that you can do considerably uh, smaller carbon footprint for a plant-based product. 
uh, than you can an animal-based product. And so the suggestion by things like World Bank and United Nations and, and others is that we are going to not eliminate, but reduce animal-based proteins and increase plant-based proteins. What the problem is now is it's not affordable. So to your important question, no, it should make its way into developing countries as well. Everyone should have a share in those technologies. Uh, the burden, uh, the added climate uh, burden, the added uh, burden of raising livestock, which is very expensive and time consuming, shouldn't be left at the doorstep of developing countries. That burden should be shared equitably and show should the benefits of the technology. And so the answer is it should be everywhere. It's just going to take a little longer to get to developing countries because they don't have the infrastructure to process it. Interesting. Thank you. Um, we have another follow-up question from Marta. Um, I think either Stephanie or Mark Robson can give insight here. Um, but in Ukraine, there is a serious problem with, with school meals. And um, they're never given vegetables, fruits, juices for lunch. Um, which obviously isn't isn't good because children do not get the benefit from having those options. Um, however, the situation in universities is completely different. You can choose anything from vegetables to cheesecakes. Um, in your opinion, how should the state should the state change, if at all, the diet of school children? Um, are there ideas you have to kind of help the situation. Um, is there anything you'd like to Stephanie, you go first and then I'll follow up on yours. Sounds perfect. So I think um, school food programs are very, very important. So here um, in the US, we the only reason our school our school food programs are successful is because of the government um, stepping in. So the rules that have been put in place and the guidelines that they review every year um, have, has made tremendous impact on the required fruits and vegetables. Um, they've recently, um, there's a couple different levels. They've got them color coded here. So you need to have, you know, it's not just a fruit and vegetable anymore. You need to have a red or orange fruit and vegetable. Then you also need to have a green or a red fruit and vegetable. So they've even classified it differently now to make sure that schools are giving you a fruit and a vegetable or getting those different vitamins that come. Um, it's kind of funny, it's color related with the fruits, so that's why they do it, but the different vitamins that come from different produce. So they've even gone as far as not only is it included, they've increased the amount that's required and they've separated into categories so that you get multiple servings. Um, over the past year with all the school closures, the other step in that they had was making sure that these school programs were still running even when students were virtual, uh, especially because most of the students on school food programs here in the US are also from your lower income housing, uh, your lower income communities. So they didn't have access when they were at home. So they saw that this was gonna be a problem and they realized how important it was. They decided to run the school food program for them at home. So I'm not familiar with uh, Ukraine's uh, structure, but I would say if you're not going to get the government involved to help regulate it or other major um, associations to help push it, um, you know, here in the US, we have organizations like United Fresh um, Produce Industry, and they have lobbyists down in DC who are constantly working for, you know, better, better. Um, situations at the farm level for laborers, better programs in the school for students. So they're out there fighting for our industry um, and getting the government to step in and help. So I, I definitely think it is something important, definitely something they should push for. And, and I just want to say, Stephanie, you nailed it. Um, a couple things about U.S. school lunches. As Stephanie points out, for many places in, in urban areas where children don't have adequate nutrition, that school lunch and school breakfast might be the only wholesome, healthy meals those little folks have. And we know that if you don't have healthy meal in your stomach in the morning, you can't concentrate, especially when you're five and six years old. Maybe when you're, you know, a geriatric like me, it's not as important. But when you're a young, developing mind, you need it for energy and for concentration. Now, what guides school lunches, of course, is that you have to make lots of food for the masses. And of course, that's not easy. You know, it's easy to cook for three people at your house. It's very hard to cook for 700 people. So whether it's the US or whether it's the Ukraine, certainly a gourmet meal you cannot make for 700 people. So I think school lunches get a bad reputation, usually a little bit undeserved, 
uh, you know, they're based on nutrition, they're based on affordability, they're not necessarily based on presentation and, uh, you know, architecture. So um, I think that uh, schools have worked harder in recent times in the US and I'm sure around the world. I know I've seen it in Asia where they have tried not only to improve the quality of nutrition since it's an emphasis now, but also they make it more appealing because, you know, the, we always tell you, and you know, Stephanie knows this when she markets products that you taste things first with your eyes. And if they look good with your eyes, then eventually they make it to your tongue and your tummy. So I think, uh, yes, a little bit more effort can be done on, uh, on visual appeal, but uh, the bottom line is to get nutrition food in, inside of you know, five and six and seven year olds. And as somebody who's had uh, several wonderful meals in Ukraine, I have to say that I could sit and eat Ukrainian food all day long, except that I wouldn't be able to fit in the seat on the way home. Back to you, Steph. Okay, going back to you, um, Mark, um, Stephanie, do you have an answer for this? Because I have another couple of questions and one of them is very pertinent for Dr. Robson. Go ahead, jump right in. All right, Mark, this is a question from one of the students in Ukraine. What danger does a rapid decline in food demand in a pandemic pose to the governments of any country? Excellent question. Thank yeah. you for asking that. So it does two things. A rapid decline disrupts the entire supply chain and it disrupts the producer's ability for income. So, you know, in many places, especially the places around the world where, you know, subsistence farmers, if you can remember back to June when I visited uh, during the webinar series, I talked about the fact that, you know, 80% or so of the people around the world have some connection with agriculture. 70% of these folks are farmers are the main part of the GDP in the country. So when the small farmer, and it's a small farmer, it's not a big corporate farm in the middle of America, it's a small farm, you know, in uh, Southeast Asia, in India, in West Africa. And so when those folks are not able to sell their product because they can't transport it, then they don't have any income. And the government, of course, relies on two things. They have to keep their population alive and healthy, and they have to get taxes from them. If I have no income, I can't generate any taxes. And if I have no income, all of a sudden now the government has to take care of me. So a decline in demand for food, even if it's because I'm on the other end and I can't afford the food, or the food's not there and so I no longer, uh, it's not there and so there's no demand because it's not in my market, it totally disrupts the supply chain, the tax base, and the overall health and quality of the individuals. And government is the biggest stakeholder here because government has positioned themselves to be the beneficiary during good times. So in a pandemic, they have to step up and be the people who facilitate the recovery in the bad times, whether it's the most developed country in the world or the country that's very much struggling as a developing country. Thank but you, Mark. Thank you. And this is for you, Stephanie, uh, from also from one of the students. I know that you cooperate with schools in making sure that children have access to fresh foods and vegetables. I loved your story about kiwis. Are there any other interesting stories that you could share in developing new programs to get children interested in good food? So, the the fruit that i what i usually recommend is going in with fruit first fruit is going to be naturally sweeter so they're going to get more excited about it then i like to go with a vegetable product um anytime you're going with fruit you're going to want to go with something that's in season um so you know we mentioned it before that we shop with our eyes here we definitely do we want stuff that looks pretty but just because it looks pretty doesn't mean it's always going to be the best flavor so you know I'm, I always recommend going in when you're buying fruit in your store and talk to your produce manager, talk to someone who's working in that area of the store. They're gonna guide you to what's gonna be, you know, the best best to eat at the best time of year. Um, and that's the way you're gonna find out that great piece of fruit. Because I have to tell you, I mean, lychee nuts, kiwis, you know, some of these exotic fruits out there are all wonderful. But there's some amazing apples out there. There are some amazing pears out there. And just knowing which varieties and what time of year to get them can make all the difference. So don't don't uh, don't shrug off some of the less exciting ones. Definitely go after the ones that taste the best. 
Uh, actually, I love honeydews, so you know, I'm talking about If you like honeydews, give it about apple. one more month. <laughs> it reminds me of an old variety called Ranaka that my mother used to tell me that uh, grew in their uh, country estates. Wow. <laughs> anyway, this is another question for you. What are the main features of a wholesale distributor profession? How do you get into it? Uh, so I was born into this business. It is a family business. And you'll find that a lot of produce companies, whether it be at the farming level or in somewhere in the supply chain, are a lot of family businesses. But honestly, uh, go out there and look, because there's places like us all over the world. I've been to wholesale markets all over the world, and they're very similar. Um, everywhere in the world, people eat fruits and vegetables. Our business is a simple one. Uh, you know, we we, we buy fruits and vegetables from the farmers. We bring them to our warehouse. We mix and match all the different ones on a truck. So, you know, we'll, we'll bring in a thousand boxes and I'll give two to this guy and 10 to that guy. And we'll distribute all these different fruits and vegetables out to the retailer. Um, a lot of our pricing is kind of negotiated on the spot uh, because like I mentioned before, mother nature really controls our supply and we're a supply and demand business. So with big supply, we're going to drop our prices down. So we'll do some negotiations right there with the customers. Uh, it's a very exciting business. I would say um, if you're in the area and you're really looking to get in it, uh, give me a call when we're done here and I'll definitely sign you up. We're always looking for people who are interested. You know, it takes a lot of passion in this business. It can, it can be challenging. I mean, we're working against the clock. As soon as you pick produce, it's starting to die. So we have that time factor involved. We're trying to get it, you know, to that end user so they can still eat it before it starts to go bad. So we have to be quick. You know, we have to be able to work. We have to be able to kind of move and bend. So if you have that passion and dedication, you're going to be good in this business. Also, if you're a people person, so you're going to interact a lot with people in this industry. This past year was one of the biggest challenges for our industry because we're so used to seeing each other all the time. You know, I'll, I'll travel all around the country, all around the world to go visit our farmers and really experience what they're experiencing. So being very personable will get you far in this industry too. This seems to be in line with what you just finished. This is a question. How much has the role of the distributor increased or decreased with the outbreak of the pandemic? Has it affected your workload and how? So in the very beginning, um, you know, it affected us a lot. We had a lot of challenges out there. Like I mentioned before, a lot of our customers had challenges too. So we had to be able to adjust, increase the amount of deliveries we were making to our customers. Um, some of the distribution, some of the main centers that we used to go to and that they used to distribute out themselves were shorthanded. So we had to make some new deliveries to some new customers that never used to get deliveries from us. Um, and then as time progressed, the next move was really adapting to the new buying patterns. So it went from just delivering more to delivering at different times. You know, people went from shopping every day to shopping as, um, as you know, as li little as possible because they didn't want to go in the store. People would go in there uh, maybe once a week. So certain more perishable items, maybe like a raspberry, we didn't sell as much of where potatoes and onions that are a little bit more shelf stable and people were going in and buying in bulk, they could take. So we had to adjust that over the last, you know, six months, I'd say we've started to see shopping behaviors return back to normal. So our distribution lines, our busy days have kind of gone back to what they used to be. So I think on the kind of a year later, I would say our model is similar to what it was before. It's just transitioned and you know, we, we've, we've kind of expanded our reach. Some new businesses have popped up that didn't exist before. A lot more online delivery um, businesses have opened up. We've closed, some of the restaurants have closed down. So some of those customers have gone away from us. So we've seen a little bit of a shift in the type of customers we've um, serviced to, but we're, we're, we're right here in the mix of it and we're still sending stuff out just like we did the whole time. Okay, the, this is another question. Uh, is there any way, and I don't know, I guess both you and uh, uh, Professor Robson can answer that. To what extent have underprivileged poor children who are suffering from lack of security and whose parents cannot afford to give them the food, uh, what can be done about them? And how can you take care of them? So I, I think, I think the biggest thing you can do is 
all that you can do. So I think this is a, a, a great example of where you can get the private sector and the public sector to partner up to work to work together. You know, uh, particularly with us, we work with um, uh, some of the city councilmen um, right in our area to help distribute food out to those in need. So um, over this past year and, and in the past really before it, we'd partner up with, um, you know, our local councilmen who knew the different areas of his community that might have had a little bit more trouble than others so we could get the product directly to them uh, whether it be through donations whether it be through working with another private you know their uh, private company you know there's one there's one event that we run where we donate some of the produce and then another company came in and they donated um, computers um, for, this was for a school and then they had another company who came in and donated at home school supplies and between these three private companies and this one public organization, all four of us were able to come together and set up these children and these families who couldn't afford to do it otherwise to run schools out of their house. And they had everything that they needed. And they were able to continue on, you know, life as normal, as normal as you can be without having that hiccup. So I think you really need everybody's involvement to kind of combat it. To what extent has the role of the distribu uh, distributor increased with the outbreak of the pandemic? And what do you what do you think is going to be the reaction in the future? Would that re problem be resolved? So, I, I think we touched a little bit on yes. um, how it's changed our business, and I think what we're going to see in the future is going to be this continued um, importance on making sure that the supply chain is really intact and that you have lots of outlets to go with places. You know, one of the first hangups that we had during the pandemic was kind of a bottleneck at on the supply side because we hit a certain point where we couldn't get the produce to the end user. So whether it be a shortage of labor, shortage of trucks, um, you know, just too many steps in that supply chain um, that normally would have worked, but because people were shorthanded, you know, that we were kind of getting stuck. Uh, one program that they actually rolled out here in the United States was a farm to family food box program. And they put it on private companies to string things together and coordinate with distribution uh, processing companies, farmers to where the farmers would produce it. You know, someone wholesaler like me would collect it all. I'd work with a repacker who would then take, you know, one apple and one banana and make a mix box out of it. And then we partnered with um, a charitable organization to help get the donation out to that end user because um, um, companies and um, associations like City Harvest and food banks were, weren't able to get it out fast enough to those who needed it. And they weren't able to get it to the end user right at their houses. So they set up these little mini supply chains and mini distribution centers. And I could see that type of program being able to be rolled out in the future faster when we run into some of these supply chain things that are inevitably going to happen, you know, so it, it's a kind of a, a proven fixed to it now. So we have a little bit of a roadmap to follow. Mark, you missed the question. But anyway, the question was, how can underprivileged poor children in the world uh, be uh, taken care of during the time of the pandemic and the food shortage? But you literally have about half a minute to answer it. <laughs> and, and so in a half a minute, I think there's three parts. The first part is that I think the pandemic has taught us that people are willing to help each other. I think the goodness and kindness of people all over the globe, no matter what your social or economic status is, has evidenced itself now. So people are helping each other. I think people are becoming more resourceful. Things that might not have been that appealing to them before, people realize they have good caloric and uh, protein value, and they've now become more acceptable to eat. And the last thing is, I think that the pandemic has demonstrated us the disparities around the world and the fact that the wealthier nations like our own here in the US, as well as others in Western Europe need to step up. And I think that's how we only slowly begin to help. And of course, we rely on important groups like you know what Susie represents here with people that are really boots on the ground, people that are making it happen. Thank you. Well, um, 
with this, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Stephanie, for a very, very interesting and informative presentation. Then, of course, Mark, you know how I feel about all your contribution, even though you're schmucking right now. And Susie, thank you very, very much for helping with the moderating. You did a wonderful job. I would like to thank all of you. I would also like to let you know that uh, uh, next week, due to the holidays, we will not have our webinar session. Our next webinar session is going to be April 7th, and Ferry Gaba is going to be talking about using the drones for distribution of medicine and other products. So that should be very, very interesting. So again, thank you very much, and have a wonderful holiday and a very good week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.